I can officially welcome you to our program written by with author Stacy Lee. And as the program title suggests and makes obvious, we have Stacy Lee with us. Hey, Stacy. Hi. <laughs> and I see you're accompanied by someone. Uh, we're, uh, great to see you as well. Welcome back. Uh, if, for those of you who may recall, Stacy participated in our Teen Lit Fest uh, last fall. So we're great. It's great to have you back. And I see you have someone with you this evening. Yes, I decided to bring my daughter, my 17-year-old daughter. Um, I pulled her out of her room. We're in my home office right now, actually. And I thought, what better conversation partner would be than Ava, who's read all my books and probably knows them as well as me. So I thought we would have to chat about my hey, the more the merrier. So welcome. We're glad to have you here. Thank All you. right. So before we get going, we have a few things we'd like to just go over. We have a book shout out tonight. Uh, well, it's a Stacy Lee book. It's the Downstairs Girl. Now we have both physical and ebook copies in our collection. Um, if you'd like to check out the ebook, it's available in Overdrive um, through the Libby app. And you can also, uh, if you'd like to access the physical book, you can reserve it or check it out if it's available. Uh, either way, if you want to see what copies are available, you can go to our catalog at hcplc.org slash books. And also, we wanted to give another shout out. This month, May, is Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And we wanted to just highlight um, a great virtual museum and kind of traveling museum the Asian Pacific American Centers that's part of the Smithsonian. And uh, they're doing a lot of activities and events this month. And to learn more about what they offer, um, current exhibits, um, they have uh, online events and current projects that they work on. It's really very interesting. They're, they do a lot there. You can see all of this at smithsonianapa.org. So we encourage you all to look at that as well. So I have the honor of introducing our guest and her wonderful daughter this evening we have author stacy lee with us stacy is a best-selling author new york times best-selling author uh, the downstairs girl being one of her most recent titles and behind her you can see a poster there luck of the titanic is her most recent book which is also in our catalog you can access it as an ebook currently but we are very honored to have you here with us tonight stacy and your daughter and we look forward to hearing about just writing and your experiences and all of that great Great things that you have to say. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn my camera and microphone off and hand things over to you two, and I'll be back in a little bit. Sounds Thank good. You. Thanks so much, Chris. Thanks for that great introduction. Um, well, actually, I'm gonna let my daughter, Avalon, share a little bit about herself, and then, um, then you can take it away. Yeah, hello. My name is Avalon, and a little bit about myself is I've been on this earth for 17 years. <laughs> uh, like my mother, I write prose, but I also dip into poetry. Um, yeah, you can find me on Instagram at Avalon Please Sleep. Excellent. Very deep, profound poetry, I might add. Thank you. And Thank I you. Always, Unbiased. <laughs> I always told Ava that one day I will be known not as um, Stacey Lee, the author, but Avalon Lee, the author's mother. <laughs> I look forward to that day, so. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That means a lot. <laughs> All right. So roadmap for this conversation is first we're going to talk about Stacey Lee's books, and then we're going to do industry-related things, and then fun questions. Um, so, Stacey, <laughs> Luck of the Titanic came out last week on Tuesday. Yeah. Sorry to say. Yes, May the 4th be with you day, which was yeah. kind of special for me since I'm a big Star Wars fan. Mm -hmm. As you know, since I've made you oh, watch yeah. all the movies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, Luck of the Titanic, if you didn't know, is about Val, who um, is a British stowaway on the Titanic boat. And um, she's an acrobat. I'm very bad at explaining things, but yeah, you know what happens to Titanic? doing great. <laughs> Um, so, Look at the Titanic just yesterday became an indie bestseller, which represents um, the sales of the independent bookstores. Mm -hmm. um, so, why do you think it had the impact that it did? 
Um, I think there's something about uh, Titanic stories that just uh, have always captured the imagination. Um, I know in my generation, we all watched the, the big Titanic movie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I remember asking you how many of your friends had seen the movie. And I remember, do you remember what you told me? None. Yes, you told me that. It's too old. <laughs> yes, you told me that and Leo was gross. Was like, no, you know, they only knew each other for two days. <laughs> well, despite that, you haven't seen the movie, but you knew what Titanic. I mean, yeah, well, it's Celine Dion. Oh, is yeah. that the reason? No, yeah. oh, well, the song goes <laughs> on. And, and, and there's, there's the Jack meme. The, the Jack meme. Okay, yeah, no. <laughs> no, what the Jack meme is. Mean. I need to like paint me like one of your French girls. Oh. <laughs> okay, so Ava has really introduced me to a lot of Gen Z things, and one thing I just don't quite get yet is the meme. But I have yeah, Ava. She gets it confused with TikToks. Which yeah. Are <laughs> You're learning. <laughs> so to answer your question, I do think that Titanic, the story, has always. Um, held great interest for people. I mean, it's, it's, it's so full, it's so chock full of issues. There's the social issues, the class issues. Um, there's the pride of man, you know, this was the Titanic, was the maiden voyage and the biggest ship on the sea and um, the sort of allegory for man's folly. And I think that's why Titanic stories come out every year and they are just an evergreen uh, subject matter for people. Um, what I tried to do here was find um, sort of an interesting uh, angle on the Titanic. Um, my mother-in-law, Ava's grandmother, loves to share interesting tidbits about um, Chinese people, the mother country, she's actually, she's actually Chinese Canadian, but she loves to share stories about Chinese Americans, Chinese Canadian, Chinese all around the world. And so um, I remember a few years ago in 2017, actually, she shared this story about the Chinese survivors on the Titanic. And I thought to myself, wow, that is, I didn't even know there were Chinese people on the Titanic. And so that sort of blew my mind. I wasn't sure if, um, you know, that was something I could write about because I actually, don't, uh, I don't know much about shipping and I wasn't like a huge fan. I knew about the Titanic story, but I wasn't one of those people who saw the movie again and again, mm -hmm. as people did. I mean, maybe yeah. it would have been different if we had streaming back then, but I only saw it once. So I, um, I wasn't sure if that was a subject matter I could take on. Mm -hmm. And I was writing the downstairs girl all the time. So I was sort of in the throes of another period of time and another part of the world. And I really didn't want to commit my brain to thinking about that. Um, but the story continued to sort of eat at me. And I thought it would be interesting to see why people had, why I had never uh, heard of these Chinese people on the Titanic. And so I wanted to explore that in this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember when, um, we watched the Titanic in seventh grade, or I was in seventh grade, and um, after the movie, you were in really deep thought. I was. Yeah, you were. You were just like looking off. I don't even remember. I remember like, like 2 a.m. Oh, in the morning. Oh, wow. <laughs> deep thought. Okay, yeah. so I guess I, I was um, chewing over what could potentially be this book. Mm -hmm. um, I should also mention there are, um, I'm always telling Ava that when we write stories of well-known historical events, mm -hmm. uh, which is sort of the bread and butter of um, historical fiction, to always find like a really interesting angle that people have never heard about before. And so for me, this all sort of came together, this idea that we should find a really unusual angle to explore. Um, and and uh, I don't know if you mentioned they're acrobats, did you? Yes. Okay, yes, they're acrobats. And so that was, you know, not just Chinese on the Titanic, but Chinese acrobats, which mm -hmm. um, I thought might add a fun angle. Um, okay. Yeah, well, another thing is, I, I remember reading this book, and it begins with the quote, of the eight Chinese passengers aboard the Titanic, six survived. So did you know the ending going into this book? Oh, 
Um, I did I know the ending? Did I know who of the yeah. six? Uh -huh. Well, they were so I had to really make up who these characters were. Mm -hmm. um, there wasn't a lot of information about who these passengers were, um, for reasons uh, related to the Chinese Exclusion Act. These men were not allowed into the country, unlike all the other survivors of the Titanic. They were turned away within 24 hours and sent to Cuba. And so and they were also shamed for surviving. Um, they were vilified in the newspapers as um, these, these men who dressed as women or tried to hide under the end of the seats to escape. Um, and so they did not share their stories with their families even. And so really a lot of that, that history is lost. So I did um, end up making up these eight men. Mm -hmm. And then of those six, the six who survived, it was really a mystery to me, and mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I had to just get through the story, write the story, and then see. I really did not know, even at the end, who was going to be uh, saved, mm -hmm. and ended up changing the ending several times um, and sort of playing with different endings. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that part was something that was a mystery that was unfolding as mm -hmm. I was writing the book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad you did a lot of research because, like, one thing I've like I've tried to do historical fiction and it just doesn't work out because I hate researching and I don't have the patience for it. If it's not in like the top five Google searches, then the answer is lost forever. <laughs> Such a Gen Z thing. Uh, you know what? You could be right. <laughs> but yeah, um, just like even researching for the ship. Yeah. Because like. yeah. in, the, in the Titanic movie, I remember getting super lost as to like all the floors where everything was. So yeah, was yeah, like the part of the book. yeah. In fact, that that was difficult. I think mm -hmm. um, I I ended up buying the movie and I'm watching it several <laughs> times during my research because um, trying to get it all down in my head was mm -hmm. was challenging. I actually bought a um, a blueprint of the Titanic. It's about as large as my dining room table. It's her baby. It's my baby. I it's spread true. it out. We're not allowed to touch it. <laughs> <laughs> I use <laughs> you can touch it. I use colored pencils to sort of um, I don't know help distinguish mm -hmm. passageways <laughs> and a magnifying glass and a board over that. We're <laughs> <bottom. laughs> It's so dirty. Yeah, it's so dirty. And uh, along with doing that, I was watching the movie and sort of checking because uh, mm -hmm. the James Cameron movie does a, a pretty good job, like mm -hmm. just really building it out and, and showing you where everything is. And so when I saw the movie, I didn't get where everything was, but after um, researching where everything was, I really did start understanding the movie better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that was the first thing I did. Um, and then the good thing about writing about Titanic is that it's such a well-known event. There's a lot of information. There's like a ton of information. You could spend years researching it, to be <laughs> honest. Um, I didn't have years. Um, I had my, my blueprint and I, I chose uh, several of the uh, well-known books on the Titanic and uh, did research there. There's a ton of documentaries, which is also really helpful for me, um, exploring every nook and cranny of the Titanic. And there are people who, um, actually make YouTube videos and TikTok. games. <laughs> TikToks. TikTok. I yeah. think you're thinking about the TikTok guy. TikTok guy. Yeah. There's a TikTok guy, the Titanic guy, right? Yeah. yeah. So there are people who are really invested in this. <laughs> There's just a lot of information to mine. So I think in this case, it was, uh, there was uh, an embarrassment of riches on the Titanic, not for the Chinese, but mm -hmm. on the Titanic. Mm -hmm. I always start with just trying to understand um, geographically where I am. And a lot of times that informs the story. Like, for example, one thing I learned was um, the men and women were not allowed uh, on the same part of the ship for the third class. Yeah. I was literally just reading that passage. I flipped to a random page. Really? Yeah. Oh, interesting. So wow. the men were located in the front of the ship and the women and, and the families and the children were in the back of the ship. They didn't want them to mingle just in case um, I don't know, they just in case <laughs> if they breathe. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, they didn't do that in the first class, mm -hmm. however, because it must be that they thought the first class was better behaved. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So that lent itself greatly to my story, just learning that fact, because um, 
Pelora, the main character, she is trying to convince her brother, Jamie, her twin brother, to come to America with her. He's in the third class along with his company of seamen. And she's staying in the first class dressed as a widow in mourning with a veil. And so she has to go back and forth from the third the third to the first class and keep switching out her outfits. And the fact that women were not allowed uh, where her brother was staying just added another element of tension to the story. Will she be found out, for example? Huh, interesting. Yeah. All right, well, let's talk about your first book, Under a Painted Sky. Um, okay. It's about um, a girl named Samantha who plays violin, and after she commits a crime, she and her friend Anime, who is a runaway slave, must escape down the Oregon Trail, um, yeah, fleeing the authorities. Um, so, you know, unlike the Titanic, I, don't, I really don't remember her writing this book. It just kind of appeared in my hands. <laughs> Um, but where I were busy with school, I yeah. think you entered high school, so you have less time for me. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, whereas, happens. like, for Under a Painted Sky, I remember I was in, like, second to fifth grade when she was writing, when you were writing this, oh. and I had really bad insomnia back then. I would, you know, go to sleep at mm. 2, 3 a.m. when I was, like, nine years old, mm. so... Yeah, I would just like stay in your bed and watch you write under a painted sky. I felt like I fell in love with that book in a lot of ways. Oh. Um, yeah, so can you contrast the process of writing Luck of the Titanic to Under a Painted Sky? I love that memory that you have. Um, I didn't, I don't, I barely remember that. I remember, um, well, I remember writing and I remember, yeah, I, I must have given you insomnia because I'm a night person too. Mm -hmm. um, but, I do know that you love Under a Painted Sky, mm -hmm. and that's probably, is that your favorite book? It's safe to say that. Yeah, well, also because it's dedicated to me, so <laughs> there's that extra She has a bias there. <laughs> um, yeah, the process. Oh, well, I think um, with Under a Painted Sky, I mean, the first one, you have the luxury of time, so mm -hmm. I could spend all the time I needed getting it right, and I didn't feel so bound by deadlines, et cetera, and mm -hmm. uh, I think that book got the most revision um, of any of my books, simply for that reason. Mm -hmm. So I do think that the process of writing and like, so for this book, this is my fifth book, right? Yes. Yeah. So. yeah. That's right. Okay, so this is my fifth book. That's pretty good. And I can't yeah. remember, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> I'm right. Those are my hard numbers. Okay, so this is my fifth one. And there is definitely something about going through the process that makes it a little more streamlined. I sort of know where I'm going. I know um, the places I need to go for research. And I'm able to sort of put the blinders on and not go off in too many directions, which it's easy to do when. Um, when you're researching, it's, there's so many things. You're like, you're like a dog with a squirrel. <laughs> Chase the squirrel, the squirrel. <laughs> so um, yeah, I think that made it a lot easier to research because I knew what my process was going to be. In terms of the writing, um, I always find writing is. Uh, I'm definitely someone who's a pantser, I guess, someone who doesn't really plot too much. I know where I want to go. I know maybe the midpoint, um, but I'm not always sure how I'm going to get to each point. And I leave that open um, purposefully because I know that during the process of my research, I will find something out and it will take me down a certain path. And then everything changes because of that little thing that I've discovered. So, um, I like to keep things sort of open that way, but I definitely feel like the writing process has become more streamlined because of because I'm better at researching. Mm, that's interesting because Book of the Titanic, I mean, it takes place over the course of like what, how many days? Four days? Yeah, four days. Mm -hmm. So you said that you pants books. Do you have to plot more for that book just because it, it was a lot more tighter than? Yeah. First, you know, I, I always print out a calendar um, of the month I'm working in, and I that's just one thing I do, and I write in the things that are happening on each day, 
So having just the four days um, was much easier. Do you mind closing the door? Thanks. <laughs> so, because I just had a week that I needed to work with. And so um, I really just blew up that week and broke it down by the hour. I don't know if it was any harder to plot because mm -hmm. of that, but I was very aware of um, not wanting a day to be too long. Mm -hmm. You know, like mm -hmm. I feel like if the days are too long, the reader feels that. And so I really just something about giving the characters a night of rest mm -hmm. helps with the pacing, I think. Mm -hmm. And when you only have a few days to cover, then mm -hmm. um, it can be it can be challenging to find that moment of mental rest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're running short on time. Oh, let's talk about The Downstairs Girl, which is the fourth book, so the one before Luck of the Titanic. Um, it follows Joe, who moonlights as a newspaper advice column writer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's called Dear Miss Sweetie, the advice column. And one day it just blows up. And of course, there's a backlash. <laughs> I forgot what time period. 18 something. 1890. 18 post Reconstruction. Okay, so that's what's out. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. um, so it became a New York Times bestseller like two, one month ago. Um, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, and um, I feel like since you've had three books out already before this came out, you have built like a cult of people, a cult of people. A cult. <laughs> yeah, a cult. <laughs> you really like your writing style. I mean, they called it heartfelt and witty, and also or willing to confront societal issues. Um, so I'm going to ask you the same question I did in Robert Luck of the Titanic, which is, why do you think that the Downstairs Girl had the impact it did? Particularly, I mean, this Downstairs Girl had, had been released in like 2019 mm -hmm. and it blew up in 2021. That's yeah. unusual. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, the paperback also um, came out about that time. Mm -hmm. And so I think that really helped. But when the book, the Downstairs Girl released in 2019, um, I mean, think back to, that period of time it was and still is sort of a less so now, but um, sort of a tumultuous time in, in our nation's history. And um, the downstairs girl, the character of Jo, through her advice columns is able to really address a lot of social issues um, that were going on during the post reconstruction period, um, which also was a very tumultuous time. I mean, there were the Jim Crow laws, we were, there was the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, suffrage was an issue, um, the great societal divide between the wealthy and the poor, this growing gap. Um, and so I think a lot of those issues that she addresses in the book um, really hit home with a lot of people in 2019 when it came out. Um, we were seeing the uh, rise of the Me Too movement back then, um, and then these issues continue to have relevancy, I think. So when the paperback came out, um, this was just a few months ago, that was also, I mean, there was the Atlanta shooting of the Asian mm -hmm. women and uh, voter suppression. So issues like this, I mean, I've heard it said, and I think this is true, is as writers of historical fiction, we're not really writing about the past as much as we're writing about the present. Oof. Is that deep? That's deep. Yeah. That's, you had to take a moment. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's true, especially true with the announcers girl, and I think that's probably why it uh, resonated with so many people. Hmm. Yeah. Wow, that's really deep. Thank you. I try. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. So, um, yeah, yeah, I don't know what else to say about that. Yeah, I mean, it's been a great experience. Plus, I mean, at that point, I had um, three books before that, and you call it a cult, I call it readers. I mean, people, readers, <laughs> readers have found my are work members. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Gen Z talk, sorry about that. So, yeah, I feel like um, people knew my work, and at that point, really um, just found. Mm -hmm 
that they gravitate to my style. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah, I think it's really interesting because um, I've noticed throughout America's history, we live in a society um, that people like to call Asians the model minority. Mm. Um, yeah, and just to say that we haven't been discriminated against and that we're equivalent to whites. But I feel like because of this escalation of um, Asian hate, which has always been in here, mm -hmm. um, that's why this book just gained a lot of momentum. Mm -hmm. and that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. Mm -hmm. um, so on a lighter note, <laughs> book three is called Secret of Art Note the secret of Urdu, and it follows Mimosa, who is a teen aromateur, aromateur, is that a word? Uh -huh. Aromateur, it's a, a word in my book, <laughs> <laughs> who makes love elixirs. Um, so, yeah, um, it's, it's a, I feel like it's like a huge departure from what you normally write. Because right. It is magical realism uh -huh. as opposed to historical yeah, all well, your other books are. Yeah, right. So, Secret mm -hmm. of a Heart Note was a contemporary with um, magical bits mm -hmm. in it. <laughs> um, and that was published by Catherine Teague and Harper Collins. That was my third book. And it was a departure. And I think um, if you were asking me why I did that, like why mm -hmm. I wrote such a different book, I think the answer is that, I mean, we like to put people in categories and sort of then that makes us easier to under, makes it easier for us to understand them but as you get to know people you know you find that they are made up of many different parts and maybe that's um something i think it's important to know about asian americans is that you may look at an asian american and think okay i kind of know their story but do you really know their story um so for me the secret of a heart note i actually wrote that before um, out on the moon which was my second historical and um, back then, you know, I I was new to publishing and didn't really appreciate how much how important it was to be uh, I don't know doing the same thing over not the same thing but mm -hmm. writing in the same genre because you know readers will look to you for books in the similar veins that they fell fallen in love with. So this book um, I had written because I actually have a, a weirdly sensitive nose. I can uh, smell musical pitches mm -hmm. which is very weird but i wanted to write about sort of my experience with um what would happen if there was a girl who can make love potions with her nose and it was very much about mother-daughter relationships and i think i was just writing something that interested me mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah so um there and was, by the way that was one of my favorite books to write because i think it was just fun for me and it was just like exercising a different part of my um my my writing repertoire <laughs> so there was like a difference of conceptualizing both uh the magical realism book and the historical books because i know for your historical books it always comes from like you find a unique angle to tell in history um, but this one was largely, or I'm not actually sure, but I'm pretty sure it was based <laughs> on your synesthesia, right? Like that's how it. Oh um, yeah, it yeah. Was yes, I think so. It was based off this um, this idea of um, what, because in this world, I, there's really no use for my nose unless I was, you know, in France and maybe a perfumer. I I don't think there is really <laughs> it's completely useless. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, it, it was fun to just write about in a way that oh, maybe this could be useful in uh -huh. a world. Uh -huh. But yeah, that's, that's really cool. It's like a superpower. Can I identify a little superpower? But thanks. But everyone has like a okay. So she says that everyone has a different cord that they smell like. Yes, right? everyone does. I feel like that's also a book. You get a lot of books out of that this <laughs> season. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> like how people. I don't know, match or harmonize. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it's sort of in heart mm -hmm. now, but okay, mm -hmm. I'll think about that. <laughs> so you, I'm just gonna go back to what you said. Um, you said you were surprised when your publisher wanted a book in the same vein, and you had written Secret of a Heart Note before Out on the Moon, even though Out on the Moon was the second book to be published. Yeah. 
Um, so why, why exactly is it that publishers want a book in the same thing? Like, um, do you think it's just because they're boxing authors into one genre? And does that make it harder to break out of later in your career? Oh, that's a very good question. And when I'm not quite sure I can do justice, uh, I do feel like their uh, publishers have found that uh, putting you in a certain lane and allows you to grow your readership. So, mm -hmm. and I feel like there's definitely encouragement that they want you to do that. I mean, as a young girl, did I know that I was going to be a writer of historical fiction? Definitely not. Definitely not. I really did not like history. I, if you look at my notes, they're kind of like the kite tail away. <laughs> I mean, I would fall asleep. And um, I think it's because history, you know, as it's taught in schools, maybe it's changed. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's really you interesting are. because, like, my favorite subject is history, but I oh. hate writing historical fiction. <laughs> Maybe you will one day. Maybe you'll surprise yourself and your mother. Yeah, we'll see. So, <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that I was going to enjoy writing historical fiction um, mm -hmm. or even do it. It just happens to be the book that I first put out, and I realized that I was pretty good at it. I don't know, I kind of enjoyed yeah, it too. Yeah, you are. <laughs> so, I'm kind of stuck with that. And, and I also I mean, there are so many stories that need telling. So, there's mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like I just need to keep going with it and I enjoy it. So mm -hmm. I sort of found what I like to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You said that there are some stories that need telling. Do you think that you feel a social responsibility to tell these stories? Um, sometimes you're asking me the tough Oprah question. <laughs> 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 um, I do, I do feel like I need to tell these stories. That's mm -hmm. um. That's definitely part of who I am. Um, mm -hmm. I have a little bit of a, a social justice warrior in living in me. I'm not supposed to say that. It's a <laughs> yeah. word. Is that a cringy word? Uh, well, it's not really a word people use to describe themselves. It's usually like satire. Okay. But it's fine. It's cool. <laughs> but I do yeah. feel um, compelled to, mm -hmm. to write a few wrongs if I can. I mean, are there other things I would like to write about? Sure. Are there things that I am writing about? Yes, yeah, so I'm actually writing um, some middle grade fantasy <laughs> for my career to present, which will be out next year. And I love that too. But I think that there's always a little part of me that wants to champion the small guys <laughs> for the family, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Bring on her. <laughs> Bring on her. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, I'm just going to ask you. That's a good question. Oh, so I know. Hi. Oh, I'm hi. sorry. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> okay. In about a minute or so, yeah. <laughs> uh, about a minute, we can start the Q. If you want to, if you have something else you want to discuss really quickly, that's fine. But we'll start the Q and A here after in just a second, okay? Okay, we'll wrap up this last question. Um, I know we're very non-confrontational people. Yes. Yeah. So you you confront these issues in your books. Like mm -hmm. that's, how you, that's how you use writing. I think that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that there is, I mean, if um, growing up, I was definitely the kid who felt like I couldn't speak out. Mm -hmm. And I was definitely that shy kid that you never heard from and would try to sit in the back and never raise my hand. Um, that was like part of my personality, but I still felt all those things. I mean, mm -hmm. I still had that dialogue in my head. Um, and so definitely for me, writing was the way that I could um, fight those bullies, you know? A little yeah. late response, maybe. <laughs> 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> but you know that the Zardoz song, remember? Mm -hmm. It's the comeback song. Oh, the comeback song? Yeah. Oh, there's a comeback song? I love that. Oh, I do? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you should check it up on YouTube. It's called the comeback song. And it's by Bizarre and Bark, which is the Disney Channel show. Oh, I kind of do remember that. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, well, it's like funny. delayed uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. That was my life. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that was wonderful. Those are great questions. And we've got more questions here. So, um, we can go ahead and continue with the uh, 
the Q and A. This has been a lot of fun. So let's see. We've got a question here. Someone would like to know about your current book. They want to know: Was it harder to write about a British individual for *Luck of the Titanic* as opposed to an American main character? Or are the historical differences between the present and the past more difficult to write than the difference posed by nationality? Oh, interesting. Well, I think I approached Valora as um, I would approach any of my characters, trying to understand where she's from, and that includes her nationality and what makes her tick, and the things that she might have been exposed to, and um, mm -hmm. how that shapes her personality. I don't think it was any more difficult to write about her. I think um, the challenge was to understand uh, London and understand mm -hmm. a country where I've never been there before. Even I got to go in 2019 before the pandemic hit, thankfully, and uh, got to explore a little. And so that was um, a huge privilege and honor to go and, and see the, uh, the city that she might have grown up in. Yeah. As far as the historical differences, you know, I think it's about the same with every book, just trying to understand the time period. And one of the things I'm always looking for is what were the social issues, because I think that so impacts um, the characters and the social milieu in which they were, you know, interacting. So much shaped um, how they how they grew up and how people responded to them. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So the next question is actually for your daughter. <laughs> um, with such a wonderful author as your mother, what books do you like to read? And perhaps you can name a favorite. Well, my favorite books are my mother's. Oh, oh. I'm required <laughs> her to say that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I. I mean, I mentioned this already. I feel like. Um, my favorite book is Under a Painted Sky, just because it's the one that I have the deepest personal connection to. But I don't know, I feel like your books keep getting better and better. So oh, yeah. before I liked the downstairs girl objectively more. And now I like this book. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. But uh-huh. Yeah. Ava was a huge um YA reader. In fact, she's the president of the Books Inc. Teen Book Club. <laughs> and so she 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 knows her YA books pretty well and I feel like um you're gravity you're now at that age where you're starting to read more adult books mm -hmm. well yeah I remember in 2020 when the pandemic started I kind of fell off reading YA and I don't really read YA anymore in this <laughs> mom's book <laughs> um yeah I've been really into poetry and short stories and graphic novels mm -hmm. yeah before I used to be like just YA Mm -hmm. One of those people. <laughs> yeah, and the, a lot of the people you're reading now, I don't mm -hmm. even know. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. it's a different atmosphere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that question. Yeah. And you didn't give me any shout outs. Give a yeah. shout out. Kelly Lloyd Gilbert just read, uh, wrote a great book that I think Ava is interested in called um, When We Were Infinite. Do we have it over there? Yeah, the book just like wait. Yeah, it's like great. <laughs> and I think it's it's so great because it deals with Asian American teenagers, um, mm -hmm. and uh, in the Bay Area, which I thought Ava could really relate to. That's where we live, and they're also um, orchestra members, <laughs> which you never really saw in when I was growing up. You, you didn't see books about Asian Americans in contemporary settings. Or being band nerds, you know. Mm -hmm. that, so that all, um, that all, I think, is a pretty amazing development in our industry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another shout out to Ocean Vuong, who's never going to watch this. Ocean Vuong. Oh, he's a poet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, he's also a novelist. You're a novelist. And a novelist. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Great answer. Thank you for sharing that. We have another. You mentioned um, that one of your novels, you branched out of historical fiction. Um, are there any other genres that you would like to try genre hopping into? Anything that? 
Oh yeah. Um, I I always thought that I'm a big mystery uh, person. <laughs> I love reading mystery. Um, Sue Grafton. I'm a big fan of Sue Grafton novels. She passed away a few years ago, sadly. But I always thought I would write uh, like a Kinsey Milhelm character, and um, that was her protagonist, her detective. I think right. that would be super fun. So it'd be mystery. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe in the future you'll do something cool. Um, you, I know you mentioned something that was forthcoming. Are the is there? Would you like to share something about that current project with our audience? Yeah, sure. Um, so that one's called Winston Chu versus the Winsies, and it's about a twelve-year-old boy growing up in San Francisco. He saves uh, the store owner from a robbery, and the store owner invites him in to choose out one of like one of his whimsies in his story. He's got a store full of like weird things and tells Winston, the first thing you touch is yours. Winston's very impulsive. He sees a bird fly into the store and attempts to save the bird by grabbing a broom. <laughs> An old broom. So that's what he has to take home. And it turns out this broom is more a curse than a blessing. It starts taking stuff. So uh it's it's a lot of fun. I just turned in the first draft. Uh, we'll probably see it next year, hopefully if the first draft goes well. <laughs> That's a very uh, Stacey Lee story. Yeah, like every event is very, especially yeah. saving birds. She's really into birds. Oh, we yeah. have a game based on birds. Yes, Wayne Man, man, yeah. that was a great game. So yeah, I, I do love um, the middle grade humor. <laughs> I love middle, yeah. I love middle grade humor. <laughs> Funny humor. I do enjoy writing that. <laughs> so yeah, and I have there will be a sequel to it. So it's a two, two part. Wonderful. Well, we look forward to that. We actually have a question from. It appears we have a younger person in the audience. They say, "I am too young to read your books, but do you have a favorite children's author?" Ah, well, when I was growing up, um, you know, I read. I read a lot of. Uh, I read pretty. I I read whatever my mother um, brought me, and mm -hmm. I feel like that was very. Um, you know, uh, there was a lot of Judy Bloom <laughs> coming in. Or maybe that's too. Well, Judy Bloom wrote Middle Grade too. Yeah. So I don't know. Me too. Are. What you gave it to me too? I did give it to you too. Um, and she dealt with a lot of like contemporary issues, which I I really loved. Um. I love the Mouse and the Motorcycle. I loved all. The, I loved all those classic children's books. I mean, I was a big um, Little House on the Prairie fan. Of course, I didn't make you read those. Now, I think that there are some problems with those books. Actually, there's some problems with a lot of the books that I read growing up, like the um, Frank Baum's Company in Times Square. <laughs> Frank Baum's um, Oz books, Blue Oz, were my favorites. Um, and I love the fantasy. Again, I wouldn't suggest mm -hmm. that you read them now because I think that there's problems with it. Mm -hmm. But there's so much great literature out there now mm -hmm. that you don't have to rely on those old classics. Mm -hmm. But I like everything. I, it ran the gamut from contemporary to fantasy to mm -hmm. uh, science fiction. So, yeah, I'm definitely one of these people. Like people think that historical fiction writers um, must only read historical fiction, but definitely not true in my case. I'm just looking for a great story. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and you know, so many great books, so many great authors. It's hard to pick a favorite. You know, it's it, there's so many good games. As you were saying, there's so many books that influenced you and that you enjoyed as a child and an adult. So yeah, oh, right. We have time for, it looks like we have time for one more question. So let's see. Oh, here's a good one. What writing advice would you give to your younger self? My younger self? Um, well, what writing advice would I give to you? What writing advice have I given to you? And I, I think for me, I, I don't know if I, I always thought it was possible for me to make a living off this because, mm -hmm. you know, when I was younger, we didn't have a lot of Asian, we didn't have any Asian authors, Asian American authors writing children that I knew of. It was very hard to find that. And um, I think if I had 
gone in with the attitude that, oh, this is possible. I can do that. I probably would have started a little younger. What do you think? Do you, I mean, because you, you already know that you want to be a writer. And that's, I am a writer. You are a writer because you write. Yeah, you know, well, it's, it's funny because I remember when I was in fifth grade, we had this, um, oh, all the classmates had to guess each other's profession in like 20 years. Oh, yeah. And everyone said writer for me, except that I really did not want to be a yeah, janitor. Yeah, I remember saying that I got to be a janitor and a writer. Oh, wow. Yeah. No dig on janitor. Yeah, right. right. But the thing is, like, I would always watch you write. And it just took so much time, and you were just sitting there writing sentences. And yeah, when you're a kid, you don't like writing sentences. That's boring. <laughs> That's true. Um, so, yeah. like, I just do not like writing. But in a way, it's like definitely something you've chosen. Like for me, I would have done that if mm -hmm. I had thought that that lane would have been open to me, mm -hmm. you know. And I think um, I would have told my younger self, "Yeah, you can do it. You can go for it. Anything is possible." Yeah. All right. Well, that is all the time that we have for questions. Thank you, everyone, for your wonderful questions. And thank you. Thank you both for joining us this evening and sharing and giving us a glimpse into your your home life and your writing life. And just it's it's a, it's wonderful and we appreciate it all. I'm going to go ahead and bring up our closing slide here. If you'd like to contact the library, you can call the number here on our screen at 813-273-3652, or you can go online to our website at hcplc.org slash contact. Also on our website, you can uh, find out about upcoming events at uh, hcplc.org slash events. And you can also share your story, how the library has impacted your life. Uh, we're really interested in hearing from you. So if you'd like to send us your story, you can go to hcplc.org slash about slash stories. And, you know, we've heard a lot about stories tonight and great author was in our midst and we're very grateful for your time, Stacey. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone who joined us. And we'll see you all very soon. Have a great evening, everyone. Good night. Bye. 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 Take care.